father made all our clothes. My father brought home all the suits and coat samples, three daughters and a, you know, four women, and whatever fit you, you wore. I didn't buy a coat until I was 18 or 19. Was it an electric one or one of those ones you use the foot pedal for? It was a pedal and then later automatic, but we were not allowed to touch the sewing machine. My mother was very liberated. She was a socialist. She voted for Norman Thomas. She instilled great pacifist, nonviolent socialist principles in us. And she said she covered the machine and she wouldn't let us wash dishes. She said, my girls are not going to lose their lives over a sewing machine or a stove the way I did. So, and then after I uh, married the first time, which she was against when I was 17 and a half, she went away to Florida and my father and sisters packed up that apartment and my father divorced her, made a very good settlement, but he went with a woman for 18 years, a widow who had a bakery on 167th Street and was very loyal to her sons. And they have recently, oh well, since my father died, they have become friends of mine. Well, didn't you say that he was seeing her while they were married? He saw her for 18 years. <clears throat> when did that begin? What year was that? 18 years before I married. Okay. So it was in the 20s or 30s. So he Why didn't he, why was he estranged from your mother? She was very ambitious for him and she um, pushed him, um, made him go to design class while he was still a ma working 12 hours a day as a machine operator and everything. He became something with his talent, but she was um, literate. She went to school. She later graduated public school. She was an ambitious American who did not want to have an accent. And when she took me to radio, she never spoke. She just say like, how do you do? How are you? And didn't speak to the other mothers because she was afraid they would find out she was an immigrant. There was a lot of discrimination against Jewish didn't immigrants. Did your father go to school? I mean, did he go to any kind of elementary school or anything? No. 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 He could read and write. Okay. I don't know how or why, but he voted, and he was a socialist also. But he just wasn't as he was a clown. He entertained all the men in the shop. Mm. And I needed permission of one parent to get married in Connecticut the first time, because I was 17 and a half. And if you're under 18, you need it at those days. So you, we had to go to- So you were low? Eloped to, to Connecticut. But I had to come down, I had to bring the paper to his shop. And I used to meet him down in his shop. And they always had a, a bottle of schnapps underneath the counter for an event and little schnapps glasses and my father passed those around while wearing his designer's apron which was he made it out of cloth and had pockets for his patterns and his ruler and his scissor his tools. and his tools and he stood up with his black apron and he made the men come in and he said my daughter's getting married now all I have to do is marry off my wife <laughs> and those were the kind, and everybody... Well, didn't you say personality-wise, did they not match? Then, no, they didn't match. She was literate and, uh, in retrospect now, I believe compulsive and very, um, uh, very wanted to be a proper American. And when she was a girl, I have pictures of her in a white starched blouse and black skirt, very beautiful, but she had just the one blouse. She stayed up all night washing it and bleaching it and ironing it with starch, definitely compulsive to 
be sure that, and when we went to school, and I'll show you pictures of me in fantastic outfits that she made, three quarter socks, um, and she saved money from what my father used to give her, which was called table money, which was for her to buy food. And he came home every night and stood at the stove and ate whatever it was she cooked and then left, went to his girlfriend, then he came home and slept in a separate room. And my mother and I slept in a double bed in a separate room. So she was more the rigid person, he was more the... Very permissive. Humor. And in fact, his, his, uh, work, his workmates called him Meshuganamox, Crazy Max, because he entertained them during lunchtime on the street corner and uh, uh, always had humor and he loved to sing. He loved to sing with the radio. He was very musical and he sang at all weddings. And when he used to get up at our cousin's weddings and say to the band, play um, uh, I'll Get By, they'd say what key and he'd say, any key. And then he'd sing I'll Get By beautifully. And he loved to turn on his radio. And um, he had some gallbladder trouble. And he was married. And he loved to go to the Catskill Mountain Resorts for his vacation. And uh, uh, he loved when you could eat around the clock. He wasn't fat, but he he loved to eat, and he uh, loved to play cards in the mountains. And um, well, didn't you say he divorced your mother? He divorced my mother. He married Belle Rose. Rose. And they were having a very good life. But my sister Francie was obviously was is a little off, and. She never forgave my father for having a girlfriend. Well, I don't understand. He lived at your house and slept at night there. Yes, because a Jewish father does not leave his children. But when did he marry? When did he actually marry her? When I, when, after everyone was married, and even Francie had children, and I had Lisa, and I lived at 81st Street between 2nd and 3rd with my first husband, and when Lisa was an infant, my father came to me and he said, I've married Rose. He said, but your sister Francie does not accept it. You know, could I help him with that? So I said, uh, uh, what's the problem? He says, well, she won't talk to me because I've married Rose. And Francie was crazy compulsive. I said, Francie, this woman is taking care of him. She said he could come to my house and be in a bed here. I would take care of him. So she obviously did not want to relinquish her father. And my father was nuts about Francie. Mm. And, uh, uh, and he used to take us all, my sister Thelma, me, Sydney, to Francie's in Rye, New York, and he'd bring all bakery stuff from his girlfriend, and he'd drive us there on a Sunday with rolls and bagels and cake, and uh, and we'd have a good time there and go to Playland in, in Rye where Francie was raising her family. And about those rolls that you used to get on 167th Street or 170th Street in the Bronx, Neil Simon said, if he knew they weren't going to have them anymore, he would have saved a few. <laughs> he had them in Brooklyn, but they were rolls from a Jewish bakery. What happened to your father? My father was still working, and he got in the car with Rose, and they were going to the mountains. He was driving, and they got halfway there. They only had about another hour to go. It's about a two-hour trip. And he said he didn't feel well. He had a pain in his chest. They stopped off at a motel, and they were sitting in a motel. He was sitting at a table with a little portable radio. The portable radio was on the table, and he was singing with it 
and he keeled over. That was that. No pain, no nothing. How old was he? 57 or so. What year was that? I had just um, about 47 or 48. Okay. I just started with uh, Jack, and my father was very proud of his daughters. Well, he must have been proud that you were in the radio business. He was proud of everything. He mm -hmm. loved us very much. And uh, though he spent, you know, very little time with us except those Sundays, because he was estranged from my mother. Um, and when we were little, he used to take us out in his Studebaker. He loved his car. And he had begun, he had, was very active in the ILGWU and had his ribs broken on a picket line early on. But then when he became a designer, he sort of became part of management. And of all things, they had plants that were trying to get away from the ILGWU. So about once a month, he used to drive to um, Brewster, Connecticut, where there was a runaway plant where he would install. Runaway plant? Yeah, a plant trying to get away from the ILGWU. Uh, and he would install, but uh, uh, he, he loved going it was about a three-hour trip each way, and he didn't stay up there. So he was very active in the union? Yes. But then when he became part of management, and everybody lost their job during the Depression, uh, he, um, he seemed to be part of this business of plants that got away. Eventually, they all got unionized. But what I was telling you about my mother and the table money is she used to take a portion of the table money and take me downtown for lessons. Mm -hmm. And of all things, um, I got into a studio called Mabel Horsey. And of all things, Mabel Horsey was a refugee from the South who was a famous woman jazz pianist who had to uh, teach for $10 an hour people like me, she tried to teach to sing. I couldn't sing. She was sing. a black woman. Black woman. And her husband, Leonard Dickinson, was a black man who ran the studio. Where was the studio? The studio was in 1697 Broadway, which turned out to be a building that is now uh, Letterman's, David Letterman's oh, studio. Oh, the NBC studios. Yeah. So uh, it's, it, and it was an old theater and an old building. Before that, she was in the Equity Building on 46th Street, where there used to be a famous I. Miller uh, theatrical store with statues of Marilyn Miller and uh, uh, all the people that were supposed to have bought I. Miller shoes, which were trying to compete at that time with Capizio, which was the dance. Did your sisters shoe. also go to this school? Yes, and Thelma actually became a first-class tap dancer and a first-class band singer. She replaced Dinah Shaw mm -hmm. in her first job with Dick Ballou and went on the road to Canada uh, when she was 17 or 18 and also had, uh, during that time, married Irving Matt Zick, my brother-in-law, Doll who trained show horses, which was unusual for Jews Did they in live West in Chester. Chester. They lived in Port Chester, and they had a stable there that uh, uh, had um, homeless guys, were stable men. And we used to go there. I think I took you there several times. We would like to ride six horses. Didn't it change into Ryeport? Uh, Port Chester, parts of Port Chester changed into Rye Beach, uh, into Rye, Rye no, Rye, I thought it was Rye Port. It's like Rye Port, but that's not it. Well, she must have given up the singing to have babies then for a while. And then she came back and became one of the first stand-up comics. Didn't she do Ed Sullivan's show? She did the Ed Sullivan show a lot, 
and was a, a strange stand-up act in that she was very cowardly and would, I'd help her write some stuff and she'd only try one joke at a time to see if it would go from a routine when sometimes a routine just had to be talk. And by that time, I had begun to write for Jack. And whenever I gave him a joke that he didn't like, he'd say, give it to Thelma. <laughs> she had a great line, I remember, about her daughter not cleaning up her clothes and being all over the floor. Do you remember that one? Yes. So she decided to put the closet in the floor and then she right. just... <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I helped her with that But didn't she also go on to being a Broadway actress? She became a great Broadway actress. She won the Carbonell Award, which is like the Tony in Florida, for uh, Harvey's... Uh, um, for Harvey, the play uh, Tango Trio, uh, he just was in Fiddler. And wasn't she also with Zero Must Die? Well, this was his play that she won the Carbonell Award for. <coughs> then she started doing Fiddler almost to spite me because I called her down for the audition and she had to sit there maybe four hours because uh, they already had a Yentl. And um, Jamie Hammerstein was directing. Mm. He was a friend of mine. And I said... Any relation to Oscar Hammerstein? The son. I see. And a wonderful guy. And later we, I did things with him and my friend... Uh, Bob Strauss was his partner. And was Zero still in the show, or was it? Uh, no, that movie? one she did with Theo Bickel, and she did Yentl in it. And um, I said to Jamie, I want my sister to audition for this. The show had been off-Broadway already. It was on the road. And it was for Lee Guba, who I was doing work with. So Jamie said, well, I already have a Yentl that Theo wants, mm. so that has played with him. So um, uh, if she wants to wait for an audition, I'll be glad to audition her for the future. So she sat there for four hours just to spite me, to show me that she couldn't get a Broadway job. <laughs> and he, when she read for him, he said, that's the only Yentl I've ever seen that's better than the one that Theo wants. And yeah, she has it. So she played Yentl for about 10 years. I thought she played Golda. That's first Yentl for about oh, really? 10 years. And then Golda for 10 years. So she did Fiddler really for about 20 years. And she and worked she was, with Zero? She worked with Zero. Uh, uh, Lee Guba got Zero to do it on the road and then on a Broadway revival, and the only one he ever wanted was Selma. Wasn't Hesh Bernardi also in that? She did it with Hesh, she did it with uh, Luther Adler, she did it with Theo Bickel, she did it with um, um, the Metropolitan Opera Richard Tucker. Richard Tucker. She did it with all of them, mm. and at the toward the end, after she played Golda, with a lot of these people, uh, a friend of hers was doing it in stock when Zero was doing his last show. Because when Zero died in Philadelphia, Thelma was doing a very small fiddler someplace that she had to audition for. I said, Thelma, you've done it on Broadway. Michael Bennett. Uh, met Jack and me backstage, and we were going up the stairs at the Winter Garden, opening night with Zero, and Michael started to go up the stairs, and, and he didn't know Thelma was my sister, and we said, Zero's dressing room is down here. He said, no. He said, I have to see this Thelma Lee. It's the best gold I ever saw. So... Here she had gotten all that praise, great raves, and some crappy stock company lady said, oh, we have to audition everybody. Mm -hmm. I said, you just have to say to somebody like that, 
I've played it on Broadway with Zero. If you want me, I'll do it. No wonder she hated auditions. <laughs> she just was cowardly and wanted to be sure that when they gave her the job, they gave it to her after an audition and after they saw what she could do. Didn't she also do the musical Cabaret? Yes, she did Cabaret on the Road. What she part did, did she play? She there? did Lenya's part, and she was excellent, except their uh, characterization was cowardly also in that she did the accent very light. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, and so did the man playing Jack Guilford's part. I said, um, Thelma, the important part of Lenya and Mr. Schultz is that they are German and you have to differentiate them from from the Bert Convy part and the and the Sally Bowles part to make sure that people know that these were foreigners and that that they've decided to style this with the Germans having German accents so you recognize the difference and the others talk English. She said, Yeah, but I want the audience to understand me. Mm, good. Well, maybe that's better. <laughs> um, did she did she act in that in West with Lee Cooper's place? Was that, I mean, did Lee Cooper have anything to do with that production in West I Bay? don't think so. No, that one was Jack replaced uh, someone and uh, Kamala Ashland, a, a famous character actress, was playing it. No, Thelma played it in Elmsford. In da near Danbury, Connecticut. Or and Danbury and uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Ivoryton. What happened to Thelma? Thelma's got dementia, mm -hmm. and she's in a nursing home, and she's very comfortable. She doesn't even realize that her husband is dead. She thinks he's at a horse show, and she recognizes her children. And I hope to um, get thin enough to be able to travel more. Is that what counts to see? No. Well, no, I want to be thin enough to be more comfortable traveling. I really don't like airplanes. And well, they get you sick. The air is all recycled in the airplane. Yeah, well, it isn't that so much. You get, about, you get tired. Didn't you tell me something about Francie meeting you in her, in her tights, and she said something about your weight or something? Uh, Francie always says something about my weight. Yeah, but this was I saw her last day. week, and we stayed an hour, and I said to Lisa, my daughter, she, uh, uh, she's told you you should wear your hair down, but she hasn't gotten to my weight yet. But she did. <laughs> oh, but didn't you tell me one particular story? You were getting ready for something, a special event. I can't remember what it was, and she wasn't ready yet, and she had her just her tights on, and she said something. Oh, that was. Um, that was Shala's wedding in Washington D.C tights on she had nothing on oh, that's bad. she was stark naked and uh, her hair was all frizzy and all out here so and we had brought her down Barry had brought her her son had driven a van and she was there with her household helper and very tired so we installed her in her hotel room and then we went to see the father of the bride who was not feeling well because was feeling sad because his daughter was not letting him take her down the aisle. So uh, we said to Francie, tomorrow night at, um, uh, we went to a famous place, the Corcoran Gallery was where the wedding was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, we'll come here, I think it was five o'clock, to, Lisa wants to comb your hair. So we got there at 5, 5.15, maybe 5.15. And she said, she was standing there stark naked with just a cane. And she said, I thought you said you'd come at 5 o'clock. I couldn't get dressed until you combed my hair. So she got dressed in all gold, in a gold lame. But she wouldn't let us do her hair anyway. And you'll see pictures of her at the wedding with it all frizzed out here. We sat in the Corcoran Gallery 
um, uh, we we took second or third row seats because we didn't want to sit in the front row, and the bride would not let her father, who had raised her, her mother had abandoned her and her brother, and her mother was there, her maternal grandmother was there, who paid for this lavish wedding in the Corcoran Gallery, and the that's Francie, right? No, no. The shallow. The maternal grandmother. I thought shallow was Jean's daughter. Yes. You said she, Jean abandoned her? No, her mother. Oh, Shala's, Jean's wife. Shala's mother, uh, ex-wife, gave Shala and her brother to his new wife, who had three girls. So there were seven people that Jean raised. He was. But Shala wasn't Jean's daughter? Yes, but now he was remarried. Oh, I see. And... Shala lived with them, went to college, was supported by her father. Mm -hmm. Mother was a visitor, went back to teach in college. And, um, but uh, Jean made some demand on her brother when he grew up and was out of the house that he get a job. And she didn't forgive him for that. It wasn't anything he did to mm -hmm. her. But we can't even remember why she doesn't talk to him. Why didn't she let her father, why didn't she want her father to walk her down the road? Because she didn't forgive him for demanding that oh, Adam get a job. What It was so long ago that we forgot, and she even forgot what it was. But nevertheless, she wasn't talking to him. Shala is as neurotic as her grandmother, Fran. She's quite beautiful and very crazy. I and she was marrying a lawyer. Wait, Francis said something about your wife. Yes, I'm coming to that. Uh, well, when we when I came in to do her hair, she said, uh, I want to look nice at Charlotte's wedding, not be fat like you or whatever. You know, she always uh, used to say how, how small I had been awesome. uh, uh, yeah, right. in uh, my early years and how did I let myself get fat. Uh, but uh, we were sitting in the second or third row. This is interesting what... Um, how people dissemble to suit what they think happened. And uh, Jean was behind me and was very upset. She came down the aisle alone. Mm. No one gave her away. And when she got under the chuppa, and it wasn't very Jewish wedding in the Corcoran Gallery, the attendants were very chic, all dressed in black which was appropriate because it was more a funeral than a wedding. Uh, but um, she fainted, and I'm sitting in the fourth row, and they say, is there a doctor in the house? And this is this rabbi's first wedding. He's a friend of the groom. And he was very upset, and I said, well, she should have married a doctor instead of a lawyer. Uh, but anyway, the doctor fixed her up. Her mother said that it was because the dress was too tight and she hadn't eaten. So they pushed a chair under the chuppah, and she rested on the table, and then she got up and she finished the ceremony. Then upstairs, when they had the dinner, they didn't thank any of the three grandmothers who were all 90 and who were all there, and had come this terribly hot May 30th to... Isn't that your birthday? Yes. So here I had come on my birthday, traveled. We all... It was very unusually Where is that? Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. was having one of its terrible heat waves. And um, we were having this hard time. Francie was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. We brought her there, we, and she was in a wheelchair upstairs. They sat us uh, on the rim. Here's the father of the bride, uh, aunts, uh, cousins, Lisa, Barry, uh, we, they sat us at a table that was almost in the kitchen. And there was no hora. There was, the bride did not dance with her father. Did and they then, break the glass? Yes. But. You might explain for our viewers what a hookah is. 
a, a chuppah is a canopy, a wedding. That Jew, a wedding wedding canopy that Jews get married under. And even during the um, Spanish Inquisition, uh, secret Jews would take a chuppah.